I, I did the start thing. Yeah, thanks. So this is the new set of notes and this other one is the old one, uh, 8.1 to 8.4. I think I stopped at 8.3. So, um, and then another thing that I wanted to share was this paper that I just stumbled upon about uh, this Krylov or Krylov subspace approach to large portfolio optimization. So it's, I had a quick scan, didn't read it, uh, and I'm not advertising for the paper, but I, I just quick, had a quick scan. And uh, after reading the chapter, I think uh, you should be able to handle this at, at that stage. So it might be very interesting for some of you. <laughs> okay, so I think I should uh, continue with the, um, what I left behind from 8.3 8 and 8.4. So there were... So I, I might not be able to show everything for the exercises, but I would want to emphasize a couple of nice exercises like exercise 8.2.5, where you're asked to modify the power iteration command that they've provided to use a different kind of eigenvalue estimate using the Raleigh quotient. So I in the notes I put down what the Raleigh quotient is and then there's some there's a nice algebraic uh, property that if you plug in the eigen an eigenvector for into this um, Raleigh quotient, then you'll get the eigenvalue that is uh, tied to that eigenvector. So it allows you to get an eigenvalue, estimate based on an, a previous eigenvector estimate. And um, and you just have to modify the command to, to, do, to do that. And just a couple of lines, you should be able to do this. And uh, you could have a look as to its effects. Um, the other thing is uh, another exercise that might be interesting is exercise 8.3.4. Six eight point three point five has this uh, visualization. It might be interesting for you, but to be honest, I don't know what I'm. I, I mean, it's a nice looking shape, but that's about it. But I I don't know anything else aside from that. Uh, and the rest is sort of like, I I would say boilerplate in the sense that you're asked to apply an in in the inverse iteration command and then do some some plots. Okay. Um. But the more interesting exercise is 8.3.6, where uh, you're asked to do dynamic shifting. So let me just remind you of that. So in, in inverse iteration, you are the one who's providing the shift. So ideally, the shift S should be close to the target eigenvalue that you're looking for. Um, but it might be the case that you just know a starting point but you want the algorithm to sort of like adapt or at least have an updated version of S uh, every so often. So it's possible to, to do that uh, and implement a sort of dynamic shifting approach where the S gets updated after every iteration. So what I did in 8.3.6 was to sort of like make sure that the command has sort of like fixed conditions in the sense that the the seed vector or the starting the starting point for the iteration is the same uh not a random not a randomly generated uh vector that's what i did uh just so that i could control the randomness to some extent um and then modify the in the the original inverse iteration command to allow for dynamic shifting. And it's really, if you compare the two pieces of code here, it's this line that gets moved into the loop because you want S to get updated. And every time you update it, the factorization has to change too. So that's uh, what happens here. And then I update S to the most recent uh, eigenvalue estimate. And then that becomes the one that, uh, that you do factorization one more time and then repeat the process. And then, and then there are nice things about it, and it's all here as well, uh, in the in in the notes. Okay, 
like for example, in this part with dynamic shifting in a few iterations, by the third iteration, uh, the log 10 error is minus 11 already. So it's quite fast compared to without the dynamic shifting. But of course there's sort of like, I would say sleight of hand here because you 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 have a have a sense of what where the eigen what the eigenvalues are and you could choose this very very uh you could choose a starting point quite carefully in 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 that sense okay. um but the more interesting exercise related to this is 8.3.6 item C which is asking you to try a different shift a shift where you 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 could potentially see how things could break down and i think you could try it here it works i tried a different shift like 420.5 okay and of course if i the, the eigenvalues are like powers of positive integers so 21 square is 441 and then 20 square is 400 so what I did was to get something that is halfway between those two eigenvalues. And if I if my error criterion where the 441, how far it is from how far the eigenvalue is, is from 441, uh then things are working very well. But if you try modifying this to 400, I think you'll get not very good results for the dynamic uh part if i if i recall correctly so you can have a a play for that part uh so, so that you can see that it's real you really have to be very clever about the the starting point and the dynamic shifting could only do so much yeah so that's roughly what i wanted to point out about the exercises in 8.2 and 8.3. I didn't, I didn't try that thing. exercise, but did you, if you just move it down a little bit, does it then jump to the other eigenvalue or how far down you have to move it, I wonder? Oh, I, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't go deeply into it. Okay, I was more focused on the errors I'll instead. I'll have to look at that. Yeah, yeah. Feel free to explore this part. I also, uh, there, I also updated the notes to account for uh, your comment last time, Ron, about uh, Sigma. Uh, I th I think I incorporated into the into the notes. Also, the LaTeX string, where I put an extra space, uh, I was able to do it. So the escape character for if you want a space, you put a backslash, and then you have to escape that. So there's there would be two backslashes. So kind of like the command that you see here where the normal LaTeX command is this, and then you got to escape it using the backslash, something something to that effect. So now it looks a bit nicer, yeah. So, um, yeah. So roughly that's the, uh, those are the things that are new in this version of the notes. Um, now I'm gonna move on to the core of the, of the, of the chapter, which is section 8.4. Um, so in 8.4, it's really all about this Krylov or Krylov spaces. And the setup is as follows. You have an N by N matrix A, uh, and then you have a known N vector U, which is called the seed vector, and then an unknown vector, N vector X. Okay. So the context is usually syst solving systems of linear equations or finding eigenvalues. Uh, one thing that you should, I, I don't know if you noticed it yet, but uh, the matrix A, if you notice, I didn't put the word known for this part. So it's possible that this matrix A could be incompletely specified, or at least you don't know the matrix representation of A. Um, and eight point, section 8.7 talks about that actually. Like what if you don't really know the elements of A? but you know the tra a tra the transformation that is associated with a something to that effect so so uh this is this is something that is i think a bit subtle in 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 this chapter um and the word 
uh, Krylov is used in three senses uh, from what I could gather. First, it's thought of as a matrix. So the mth Krylov matrix is an n by m matrix where you see you you, you collect sort of like the uh, all of these n vectors, okay? u, a, u, a square u, a, m minus one u. You collect all of these n vectors into one matrix, okay? And uh, it's an n by m matrix. Um, and it starts from the seed vector and then you have a, u, a square u and so on. And this should be reminiscent or of, of this uh, power iteration stuff. So the previous sections have been focused on this kind of uh, multiplying the matrix by itself uh operation so so a Krylov matrix is constructed in in exactly the same manner okay so you have a seed vector and then you collect all of the matrix products a u a square u until a m minus one times u into this matrix okay so that's an uh, that's an that's the mth Krylov matrix uh, Krylov is also used in the sense of a, as, as a subspace, uh, and here's the uh, the defini the definition of a Krylov subspace uh, script K M, which is the column space of K sub M. And then the other um, use of this word is as a device or a method to achieve dimension reduction. So. When you solve systems of equations involving ax equals b, uh, and x is an n vector, okay, and you're looking for this x, instead of looking for it in Rn, you look for it in Km, okay, in script Km, and uh, there's a so it it should it should not be surprising that this m should be smaller, much smaller than n, okay. At, at least if, if you want to achieve dimension reduction, right? So you want to, you don't want to do uh, computations involving Rn, but Km instead. Um, yeah, so results from chapter two about uh, the speed in, at which you solve systems of linear equations involve the dimension of X, okay? So here there's this dimension reduction uh, brought about by using a Krylov method. And uh, how exactly is it done? Regrettably, section 8.4 doesn't tell you how it's done yet. Uh, it will show up in 8.5 and 8.6, but there's a sort of like a, a sense in which how it could be done. Um, and the idea is to do some form of least squares. Okay? So you have the distance between AX and B, and then you're looking for X in the Krylov subspace uh, script KM, okay? And then the idea is that you're gonna replace this X by what is inside this uh, Krylov, Krylov subspace, which is usually of the form K sub M times Z. So there's a theorem about the structure of a Krylov subspace in 8.4. So let me let me just put that here. And one of this it the sequence of uh, expressions that you've seen earlier really comes from theorem eight point four point two that if you have a starting matrix A and then if you if you generate these Krylov subspaces, then the X would have to have a particular if, if X belongs to that subspace, then X has to have a particular form, okay? So it's a linear combination of all of those uh, columns of a Krylov matrix, okay? So that's essentially what you see in, in this next step here. And then uh, do some work and then you'll have a least squares problem where instead of looking at A, you look at AKM times AKM as the matrix and then Z is now of substantially lower dimension than, than X. So the, the section doesn't really show actually how to solve this, but the focus is more about the structure of KM and why you see the, the dimension reduction. Okay. Of course, you don't get this for free. Uh, there's a big problem and you could see it right away from the way a Krylov matrix is formed. Uh, for one thing, 
a Krylov matrix is formed using u, a u, a square u until a m minus one u, which means that as you as you include more and more columns, okay, they're getting more and more uh, dependent on each other as m grows. Okay, so definitely ill conditioning is is kind of expected. So um, this is a situation where ill conditioning is something that you have to sort of like accept. Uh, because it it serves a, a greater purpose, which is to solve a system of linear equations that have presumably high dimension in terms of the x. So it's it seems to be a, a not so bad price to pay. So the question becomes how to how to sort of like mitigate this uh, ill conditioning. Okay, and the solution is really to find a stable basis for for a Krilo, for the Krilov subspace okay? okay and the section is about all about that okay and the idea is uh is if you if you start from the idea that uh you want to find a numerically stable basis for a Krilov subspace m then you actually have to give me m okay and then you also need a seed vector to generate this k sub m Okay. So if you think about how to create that basis, that's how you would start. But if you if you repeatedly find a numerical stable basis and you, you do it for each M, okay, and the the the, the problem is that uh you don't want to repeat this process again and again. So in the pursuit of this numerically stable basis, you don't want to do too much cal calculations. So you want a way to generate an additional element of the basis as M increases to M plus one and reuse calculations. So that sort of like the, 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 the process of thinking of a way out to deal with this ill conditioning uh, leads to Arnoldi iteration, okay? And in Arnoldi iteration, in Arnoldi iteration, the idea is to to start from a, from a numerically stable basis, what we know would be a numerically stable basis, which is uh, an orthonormal basis first, okay? So you start with an orthonormal basis for a Krilov subspace, of course you would have you would have to start with a, with some m, and typically m will start at one. Okay, so you'll start at one and then continue moving forward. Okay, uh, but if in case you already have uh, q one up to q m as an orthonormal as the orthonormal basis for Krilov subspace script k m. Okay, when you start there. Okay. The structure of this KM, okay, given by the theorem, 8.4.2, okay, what it says is that if you have something that belongs to script KM, then A times X will also be, will belong in the next Krilov subspace, K sub M plus one. So because of that, A times Q sub N will be in K script KM plus one, okay? And then you're gonna be generating the next basis element that you're gonna put uh, on top of Q1 up to QM, okay? So, um, so that's the sort of like the idea. And this uh, nested structure of this Krilov subspaces uh, allows you to do this Arnoldi iteration too. Um, so we can express AQ sub M as a linear combination of all of these uh, vectors, Q sub one, Q sub two, until Q sub M plus one, because you're now living in script K M plus one. Of course, I don't know what Q M plus one is, but I do know what Q one up to Q M would look like. Okay. Furthermore, in this um, in this expression that you see here, if you're looking for Q sub M plus one, you gotta make sure that you know H one M, H two M, until H M plus one M, H M plus one M, in order for you to be able to recover Q M plus one, okay? So, so let me repeat that. 
you know A, you know QM, you know Q1 up to QM, and the target is to find QM plus one. So if you want to find QM plus one, you also need to know what H1M, H2M until HM plus one M is gonna look like. So how do you do that? Well, because of orthonorma orthonormality, okay, um, you could do QI transpose AQ sub M. And if you do this calculation, uh, orthonormality means that uh, if it happens that, uh, let's say if you do Q1 star here, okay, Q1 star times AQ sub M, then the only thing that will survive is really this part, okay? Q1, H1, Q1 star, H1, M, Q1. And then the rest of these things will be zero by orthonormality, okay? And that allows you to recover the undetermined co constants H sub 1, M, okay? And pretty much you do the same thing for the remaining part of the... Until until you reach Q sub M, so that means that by orthonormality alone, you'll be able to pin down what H sub one M is until H sub M M. So the only thing that's left is really H sub M plus one M and Q M plus one. Okay, but the the only thing that we know really is that the Q sub M plus one belongs to an orthonormal basis, and therefore this Q sub M plus one has to have length, length one, okay? So I, I think this is probably not the best, not very precise. So this this should be a length one vector, okay? A unit, a vector of unit length. And then it should be orthogonal to Q sub one up to Q sub M. So what the what the suggestion really here is to, is to say, okay, then let me take the residual, okay? So project out uh, Q1 up to Q sub M, okay? Take them out. And what's left is this V, this residual. And make sure that your Q sub M plus one has length one. So, so what you could do there is really use the residual divided by its length. And then H sub M plus one M becomes the norm of V, okay? And that's it. You are able to generate the next uh, the next column, or if you want, the next entry of the bit of uh, the orthonormal basis for script KM plus one. Okay, and you could repeat this uh, uh, for as long as you need to. Okay, okay. So that's roughly what Arnoldi iteration looks like. Or these, uh, how it sort of like works, okay. But the iteration has to start somewhere, so you have you really have to start at m equals one, and then you also have to give a seed vector, okay. And the and because you start with m equals one, you could choose any q sub one that has length one, okay. So strictly speaking, you don't need to do any qr factorization at all, okay. So um, if you're following the book, if you're following the book, uh, you would notice that they really start off with a QR factorization and it, give, it gives the impression that you, you, you need to start with it, but actually you don't. And that might be confusing if you're reading it for the first time. So I was like, okay, do I really need a QR factorization here? It seems that you don't really need to. So, so I, I make this exp explicit here. So you, you don't need to actually do any QR factorization. You just have to start somewhere and then do the process, okay? do the iterative process. Okay? And essentially this is what, what I've just described in, in fewer words. Okay? And there's also another something magical about the Arnoldi iteration is that uh, you have a crucial identity that is exploited uh, many times in the remaining sections, which is that A times Q sub M, okay? okay. If if you write down uh, A Q sub M, okay? And paying attention to the fact that you have this kind of structure here, okay? that A Q sub M could be written as a linear combination of Q sub one up to Q sub M plus one, then you could actually represent this matrix in terms of 
not just Q1 up to QM, but Q1 up to QM plus one, along with all of these H's, okay? And you, this is some, you know, just some algebraic work, and then you'll be able to show that A Q sub M is equal to Q sub M plus one times H sub M, which is quite cool, okay? And this H sub M is, there's new terminology, which is called an upper Hessenberg matrix. And it's best remembered as upper triangular, which is this part from H21, from the second row, okay? Upper triangular plus something on top, okay? okay. So that's an upper Hessenberg uh, uh, matrix, okay? There, so that's the... Uh, in a nutshell, <laughs> in 15 minutes, what uh, Arnoldi iteration uh, is all about and what's the nice thing about it and uh, how to actually implement this uh, iteration. Okay. okay. And the remaining exercises are really about showing you that, look, Krylov, this Krylov idea seems is very looks very simple, achieves dimensional reduction, but you pay a price, which is the ill, Ill conditioning thing. So ex, exercise eight point four point two really shows you what's going on. Like, okay, if you have this matrix that looks sparse, okay, but after the tenth iter tenth iteration, or if the 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 tenth Krylov subspace you'll see something worse coming on. So you'll see that the conditioning number is at this stage already, times 10 to the A, okay? Uh, and then there are, and then you're, you're asked to explore these matrices and what happens um, uh, to their condition numbers. So let me just see 8.4.2 again. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's that part, yeah. Uh, did I do something here? Ah, yes. One thing to note is 8.4.2 points, uh, item C. Okay. And it, it's the choice of the seed vector. Uh, it's called U in the book, but in, uh, it's called U in the, in the mathematics, uh, for the book, but in the code, they use the letter E. So if you use a vector of ones as your seed vector, it might not always um, it might not always work. Okay, so that's something to uh, to pay attention to. I think it's a default in in the section. So uh, for eight point four point two item C, um, a times k, okay. A times K uh, becomes all zeros. So this is something to pay attention to. Okay. And then as a segue, 8.4.5 also shows you that uh, if you do Arnoldi iteration to this matrix, it, the results will depend on this initial vector U. Okay. So here the iteration is, sorry, the Arnoldi iteration is using this command command called uh, Arnoldi, and then this is the initial vector, okay? So this is not a vector of ones, but only one, zero, zero, zero. So if you do that, things are working, okay? This is your upper Hessenberg matrix H. This is your Q matrix, okay? But if you do a vector of ones, you get in, you run into this kind of problem, okay? Okay, so that's, I think the the more important uh, points of that the, those exercises, and finally, eight point four point seven is also very interesting in in its own right because it shows you uh, how to apply Arnoldi iteration to find eigenvalues, and I do the derivation uh, here. Uh, I think I'll leave this alone because I don't have a lot of time or right <laughs> by now, so. Uh, you could have a look uh, to the uh, as to how how the derivation goes. If there's a mistake here, let me know. But I think it it's correct, um, and you'll see this kind of derivation again in section eight point six, I think, or eight point five, I think eight point six, 
you'll see this kind of derivation again. And what I meant by that is what happens when this A matrix has some structure? So what if it's symmetric? So if it's, if it's symmetric, then if you take the transpose of this thing, it's still the same matrix. So the there would be simplifications as a result of that. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later, but that's essentially uh, something that is that that you could pay, pay attention to. And uh, when you look at this kind of matrix here, okay, it gives you this answer here. And uh, when you pre-multiply H, H sub M, this upper Hessenberg matrix by this thing, it's really an identity 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 matrix and a zero column. So the resulting answer would be another uh another matrix uh that has also this kind of Hessenberg kind of structure. Okay. And I'll leave it at at this stage for for this part. Okay. And the, you have these kinds of convergence results that you can have a look. Okay. Okay. I think I'll I'll stop here for, for 8.4. So if you have questions, do let me know. Okay. okay. So that's it for 8.4. And I hope you got the gist of uh, uh, Arnoldi iteration. And in 8.5 to 8.8, .8, it's really back to solving systems of equations using what we now know about Krilov methods and using what we know about uh about how to solve systems of linear equations and how it's going to be done so it's still roughly this kind of idea but instead of using the krilov matrix directly you use a numerically stable version of it instead that's the that's the that's 8.5 okay that's it okay and then in 8.6 what you do in 8.6 is what if A has some structure, let's say symmetry, or it's positive definite, what's gonna change? That's 8.6. And then in 8.7, it's really about what if I don't know what A actually looks like? Okay. And then in 8.8, .8, it's about uh, what is called the preconditioner. So we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later. In terms of what's new in Julia, uh, the previous uh, notes, you will see some, what, what, what's new there. But there's also something that is interesting, which which the book doesn't talk much about. And it's this thing called convergence history. Uh, and it's part of this iterative solvers uh, package, which I think is natural to really document uh, what's happening to the iterations. And it's called an instance in Julia. And this is, I think, quite a neat uh, thing to have. And uh, if you're developing stuff for that involves iterative uh, methods, having this object is very, very crucial. And uh, so in the future, maybe you could have a look at the iterative solvers package to know more about this convergence history thing. Um, the three main commands is really gm res, min res, and cg. Okay, and then the rest are really uh, how should I put it, um, incidental. Like you, you need them to for illustration. Uh, but in terms of the core, it's really gm res, min res, and cg. <clears throat> um, in terms of the highlights, uh, here's really the highlight. As I mentioned, <clears throat> if a is generic without any particular stru special structure. Um, <clears throat> it's called, you, you're gonna do Arnoldi iteration. If A is symmetric or Hermitian, uh, there would be fewer steps for the Arnoldi iteration, okay? And it leads to what is called the Lanczos uh, iteration. And then if, it, if A is Hermitian and positive definite, then it's called, uh, you're gonna use the conjugate gradient method CG. Uh, I I didn't put anything here, so th that's that's uh, what I wanted to put there. The task is really to solve the system of linear equations, and as I mentioned, instead of working with K sub M, we're gonna use Q sub M, which is the uh, the matrix 
uh, generated by Arnoldi iteration that provides numerical stability, okay? That K sub M doesn't provide. And instead of X equals KM times Z, you now have X is equal to QM times Z. And because of the Arnoldi iteration identity, okay? AQM is really Q sub M plus one, A sub M, okay? okay? And, and um, when you're gonna be finding a seed vector in the context of solving a system of linear equations, uh, perhaps a vector of ones might not be the best idea, okay? And um, what, they, what they suggest is to use B as a natural seed vector, but because Q1 has to have, a, have unit length, then it should be B divided by the norm of B, okay? And some algebra will allow you to show that uh, Q sub one could also be expressed in terms of Q sub M plus one times the uh, E sub one, which is a vector that has one in the first entry and then zeros everywhere else. Okay. And as a result, B could be written down this way. Okay, So the book is not very explicit about this part. So I, I put this down here. And the idea is that you start from finding a minimizer of this uh, of this norm, and you could express it in terms of this thing that you see here. Okay. Okay. So, so instead of working with A directly, you now work with Q sub M plus one, and then this upper Hessenberg matrix A sub M, and then you and then for a clever choice of your seed vector, you actually convert a problem here into something that looks like this, and it actually achieves dimension reduction, as you can see in the next uh, point. Um, this thing is an n by one uh, vector. So this is a norm of uh, an n by one vector, a squared norm of an n by one vector. And because of the structure of the matrix Q sub m plus one, you could rewrite this thing as W square. And this W has substantially lower dimension. It's now M, an M plus one vector. So instead of working with an N vector, you're working with an M plus one vector uh, as your uh, norm uh, that you want to minimize. So, so there are two senses in which the dimension reduction is achieved. You, instead of solving a system of, uh, and linear equations now where you want to find n entries here you're finding m entries and then instead of working with uh, the norm of a, a vector that is n by one you're now working with an, a vector that ha that has sorry you're now working with the norm of a vector that is m plus one by one so there are two ways the dimension reduction is achieved okay and Essentially, you put them all together and it would look something like this. And the idea is that you solve for Z first and then you use what you know about Z to recover X. How would you recover X? Well, if X is QM times Z, then you, you could recover you could recover X uh, from here, okay, QM times Z. So that, that that's quite nice. And that's essentially GM rest. Okay, that's essentially GM rest. Okay. Uh, so the remaining section is really about telling you that uh, it's hard to establish a convergence result. And typically, when you want to use GM rest, you have to do some restarting. Okay, because although you have now a more numerically stable basis for KM, if you increase M, you would have to have more entries in your upper Hessenberg matrix. And you also have to deal with the fact that the, the number of columns in the Q matrix is also growing. So the work and the storage requirements are 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 being are, are much larger as you as you have larger M. So that means that there has there has to be a workaround. And the workaround is really to reset somehow. They the the book doesn't tell you so much about how the reset is being done, but but 
what I could gather is that you basically have to go, you you restart. At least my understanding is that when your M is large enough, you stop and then you use whatever you have from the from that last point and feed it into the beginning once more. So you basically you start at M equals one again, something to that effect, using the information that you already have so far. Okay. And then when A is symmetric, then your GM rest is really min rest. Okay. And then when you have A is positive definite, then you the formulation becomes this conjugate gradient kind of stuff. Okay. And there you have convergence results. And again, the results, the convergence results really depend on the magnitude of the eigenvalues. And uh, there's different criteria. There are different criteria to measure convergence for these two methods, but all of them boil down to uh, condition numbers. Okay. And these condition numbers are ultimately tied to these eigenvalues at the end of the day. Um, yeah. So that's uh sort of like the the highlights of 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 those two sections um i'm not sure if I, i'll have time to really go through all of these uh exercises um some of these are so exercise 8.5.5 is i think that the exercise to really pay attention to because it really shows you that uh, the eigenvalues of your matrix will really have a, a big impact on the convergence of uh, GM rest. And I also want to point out that in section 8.5, they have an implementation of GM rest here, okay? But they also have the GM rest from the iterative solvers package, okay? And it uses this command called iterative solvers.gmrest. Okay. That's something that I want to, to point out that there's they 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 use the diff, different formulations of it. Um but again, if 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 you if you could follow the Julia code from from that section, it's really really just changing things here and there, and then looking at the impact of uh the impact of these eigenvalues, the impact of changing these this matrix to have positive and negative eigenvalues, the impact of having restarts, those kinds of things. Okay. Um, yeah. Another thing that I also want to point out is in 8.6, I don't know if it's here. Let me see. Let me look for it. Oh, no, it's not in 8.6, sorry. Um, the other thing is the theory for the conjugate gradient uh, approach. They don't talk about it very explicitly, but you could find it in exercise 8.6.5. I don't think I'll have time to really go through it, uh, but you could have a look um, at, the, at the theory behind it. And uh, it really boils down to... Um, a, it really is reminiscent of a least squares kind of problem again okay the usual kind of least squares problem you could have a look and uh if you have feedback please let me know um yeah and the, the rest is really just doing this min rest and cg cg stuff they really don't have anything new here except changing the command and the fact that the convergence criteria is different for minres and for CG. Okay. Um, anything weird here? Ah, you'll be asked to explore some weird stuff in in one of the exercises where CG is not doing very well compared to minres, and it's because uh, some of the eigenvalues are negative. Okay, so if the conjugate gradient method only works for positive definite matrices. So definitely it will not work if your some of your eigenvalues are negative. Okay. And that exercise deals with that. Okay. And in the remaining time that I have, I'll just mention a couple of highlights from 8.7 and 8.8. And um, in 8.7, is really the fact that you don't know a lot about A, but you don't, but you know a linear transformation 
uh, represented by A. And, um, and you might be in a situation where you really don't know all of the entries of A, but you know, uh, you know the linear transformation that is uh, associated with A. Okay. And they have a very cool example about blurring an image, which I think is informative. So they blur an, an image and then they ask you to de-blur the image. Okay. And the blurring matrix is actually a complicated, it could be a complicated matrix. And what if you don't know the blur, the, the method used to blur the matrix? How do you undo it? Okay, so that's uh something in 8.7. Um in 8.8, .8, it's about what happens if your A is a bit ill-conditioned. So you want to sort of like precondition it. And the idea is to multiply by something called a preconditioner, and it's usually called M inverse. And although it's it's written as M inverse, you're not supposed to invert it. And uh, there's some discussion about the fact that you don't want to, you want to choose M very carefully and there's some art uh, to it. You want, you, you want a preconditioner that doesn't change this system of equations too much. Okay, you still want to find X, that's one. The second is you don't want, uh, but you, you want to solve the system of equations fast enough, okay? Without distorting uh, this, the equality of this system, of, of the system of equations, okay? And there are two examples given in the book and it's, uh, one is, called diagonal preconditioning. And then the other one is called uh, incomplete LU factorization, okay? And uh, I think the book sort of like gives a justification for why these things might be a good idea. And I think uh, the exercises also give you a sense of uh, how they could be done. Um, yeah, um, aside from that, I I just want to point out a couple of things from the exercises and it's the blurring and the blurring exercise. There's a command that sort of like jumps out of nowhere. Uh, and if if you encounter it, you have to look look it up. Basically this clamp zero one is really cut off, do, th do some sort of hard thresholding. So if you have an entry of a matrix, make sure, make sure that it's between zero and one, something something to that effect. Uh, and it shows up out of nowhere here. So I, yeah, so you could have a look uh, into this exercise uh, to know more about it, but it's actually a, a, quite a cool example where you're, you're doing uh, this deblurring kind of stuff, okay? And then there, the other exercise is about, um, this blur matrix, the condition number of this blur matrix and what happens when K goes to infinity. Uh, another exercise is what if the what if the A, you don't know A, but you know the linear map and the linear map is this cumulative sum fun summation function, okay? Um, and then how do you use GM rest in this situation? And you'll have to give the linear map. That's essentially the new thing here. Okay, so instead of providing the matrix, you provide the linear map. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to understand how the preconditioning sort of like works, they have sort of like a, a theory exercise for that. And uh, it's here in 8.8.1. Um, the other exercise is about incomplete LU factorization, meaning that you, you want you, you the idea is that even if you start with a sparse matrix and you do an LU factorization, the L and U may not necessarily be sparse. And you might you might be in a situation where you don't want to fill in so many entries for L and U. So the idea is to do some form of incomplete LU factorization. And uh the only thing that is really new here is really to explore uh the effects of 
preconditioning in this way and how the command is going to change as a result, okay? How the commands are going to change as a result. But for 8.8.2, the more interesting thing is to really think about the art of choosing M. Um, and the and you could see a scatter plot of sort of like the complex roots. And I think this is the new thing here as well. It's not very well specified in the book, but uh, you could look up how to plot uh, the real part and the imaginary part of your eigenvalues. Okay, And what happens when you do preconditioning? The idea is that the M here is chosen in such a way that M inverse A behaves like an identity matrix. And because of that, it's easier to solve a system of linear equations that way. And as you as you change the threshold, the it becoming as you make it smaller, okay, the the resulting um the resulting preconditioned matrix uh is becoming more and more like an identity matrix. And then the remaining exercises are really about how to include preconditioning into the command and its effects and how what you think might work for one problem may not necessarily work for another problem. So that's another thing to that is pointed out. Another thing that I also want to point out for section 8.8 .8 is this part. This line here in demo 8.8.4, where I'm not really sure why they, I guess they don't want to type iterative solvers.gmrest again and again, but I think it's a little bit, yeah, I think it's superfluous, I think, but yeah, but it depends on your taste, but uh, yeah, I didn't do this anymore. So yeah. Oops. Uh, the only thing that's really new is this thing. So the PL here is really uh, pre I guess pre-multiply on the left. So this will be the preconditioning or preconditioning in left. Yeah, preconditioning left. So PL rather than P1. No? Um, yeah. And then the rest are really about timing, how much time it takes, and then uh, how a smart choice of preconditioning allows you to to get convergence faster something something like that um but I, but I but I think that's the time that I, that I have left yeah yeah so I think that that's about it for now because it's already eight yeah thanks so much yeah that was a lot <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot sorry overwhelming it, it I think. Is a lot. Oh, my no, God. it's really helpful to hear you explain after I read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let me put end here.